Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Ford, and we are here for the 10th in an ongoing series as we journey short story by short story through Ernest Hemingway's short stories in the Finca Vigia edition. Now, this is a short story known as The Three Day Blow. We will have a So What Happened section where we recap the story, a literary criticism section where we talk about the stuff that's going in on in the story, and a writer's corner section where we talk about the writerly stuff that we can take away from this story. So, well, this is a short story that does the most justice I have ever seen to a certain aspect of being a young man. Um, So what happens in this short story? Well, Nick is on foot. Old Nick Adams visiting his good buddy, Bill. Bill is staying at his father's cottage. And when Nick Adams arrives, Bill's dad is out with the gun. So naturally, the two decide to get drunk. What else would you do? And talk about baseball and literature. Because, of course. Then, Bill congratulates Nick on leaving Marge. It's a sore subject. Things get a bit mushy. Then, they both get drunker. And they're drunk. The smart thing to do would be to both go get guns and head out into the wilderness. They grab guns and go looking for Bill's dad, who they hear shooting things in the near distance. And the whole thing is a sausage fest enjoyed by all. But we'll get to that a little bit later. This short story is one... I couldn't stand this short story at first. I thought it was a throwaway thing. I thought it was just words on a page, what was someone like Hemingway doing messing around with a short story like this, what was going on there, a little bit of drama, and a couple guys having a drink. But it's more than that. So we start this short story with Nick on foot, but something very, very obvious happens here. The rain stopped as Nick turned into the road that went up through the orchard. The fruit had been picked, and the fall wind blew through the bare trees. Nick stopped and picked up a Wagner apple from beside the road, shiny in the brown grass from the rain. He put the apple in the pocket of his Mackinac coat. We start this short story with an apple. The fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, right? We start this short story with a symbol for knowledge, a symbol maybe for wisdom, a symbol for insight. So we can sort of understand that we will be getting to some type of insight in this story. We think it's all BSing. At first, and it is BSing at first. They're talking about the Cardinals, who have been a franchise in St. Louis since the 1880s. And if you ever go to St. Louis, that's really all anyone knows about is the Cardinals. But they're like St. Louis is a city that tries very hard to be East Coast. So all of their sports teams are the best sports teams that ever there have been. And they're the only ones that matter. I'm not sore because I lived in St. Louis for a couple years, but a little bit. Now, there's some interesting things to talk about in this short story. We start again with that apple. So what insight is it that could be coming to us in these pages? Well, when they're talking about their literature, they mention a book called The Ordeal of Richard Feverell. 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 However it is that one might say that, be tempted to pronounce that. In this novel, a woman leaves her husband to run away with a poet. How ghastly. And he, 
The man who's been left has to raise his son on his own, and he doesn't believe in the schools. So the man is doing it by his own teaching system. Okay, sort of a naturalist type approach, except the boy falls in love with a farmer's daughter, and he has to swear not to see her again to his father. Now, there's a lot of other drama that happens in this book. Uh, I only read the synopsis, though, so I can't tell you if it's any good. But that is pretty much all of the drama that's necessary to convey for this short story. Naturalism, women leaving, women being untrustworthy, and the idea of a young man taking a woman uh, as his own who is quote-unquote beneath him. Okay, so where do we go from there? We get this on page 90 and 91. You came out of it damned well, Bill said. Now she can marry somebody of her own sort and settle down and be happy. You can't mix oil and water, and you can't mix that sort of thing any more than if I'd marry Ida that works for the Strattons. She'd probably like it, too. Nick said nothing. The liquor had all... Oh, that's the next thing I talk about, but... We have Bill, who is congratulating Nick on having left this woman, who is not the right type of woman for you, don't you know? You are meant for something else. What else might Nick be made for? Well, in that same discussion about literature, where they mentioned the ordeal of Richard Feverell, Feverell, Feverall, there is a mention of the naked sword. Now, tip to the wise. Do not Google image search naked sword. Or maybe do. I mean, look, I don't know what you're into, but it was a bit strange to be uh, facing those pictures in the middle of a Starbucks. I hope no one was looking over my shoulder. What kind of symbol might naked sword mean? Well, it really just means a sword which has been unsheathed, but... It is a very large, so it, it is often used with homosexual overtones. Okay, so in the story, Nick asks, why would you put a sword in the bed if it, if it lays down flat, it's not going to do anything? Well, if it lays down flat, what, you're, what Nick is asking about is whether or not the sword will emasculate right? That is the worry on Nick's mind. But Bill says, no, it's just a symbol. It's a symbol for the male member, not the removal thereof. So we have, what do you imagine a symbol like that, the naked sword, and the sword is never just a sword, the gun's never just a gun, it's always a phallus, what do you imagine a symbol like that might be doing in a short story like this? Well, and the, the page numbers that I'm referencing are in the Finkovigia edition, so if you're coming to this short story through other means, they it's not going to have page 90 on it, right? But on page 90, we have the coaching that Bill gave Nick in the first place. You were very wise, Weemedge, Bill said. What do you mean, asked Nick. To bust off that Marge business, Bill said. I guess so, said Nick. It was the only thing to do. If you hadn't, by now you'd be back home working, trying to get enough money to get married. Nick said nothing. Once a man's married, he's absolutely bitched, Bill went on. He hasn't got anything... More. Nothing. Not a damn thing. He's done for. You've seen the guys that get married. Nick said nothing. You can tell them, Bill said. They get this sort of fat married look. They're done for. 
Sure, said Nick. It was probably bad busting it off, Bill said. But you always fall for someone else, and then it's all right. Fall for them, but don't let them ruin you. So, what might a sort of symbol for homosexuality be doing in a short story like this? It, this short story is definitely about love between men, right? Bill and Nick, if they can say anything about their relationship, if we can say anything about it from the outside, we would probably infer the two share a deeper connection than a couple guys passing on the street. What characters do we have in this short story? Marge is mentioned. She's never there. Bill and Nick, both guys. Bill's dad, who we hear. He's mentioned, and then late in the story, we hear him. He's there. This is men. It's just men, baby. So, we have Bill coaching Nick into choosing him over a woman. That is where these overtones come from. I don't know that we have any reason to uh, think anything other than that, anything deeper, anything perhaps more actualized or realized. But there is, through much of Hemingway, this idea of the natural world being masculine. Men hunt. Men cut down trees. Men steer the boats. And we have here a story that is both very naturalistic. They're in a cabin in the woods. They're talking about going fishing. In the end, they grab some guns to go shoot stuff. Mainly, right? But it's also all about emotions. If Nick had the actual fortitude to deal with his emotions, he wouldn't be drowning them in alcohol, would he? So there's a lot to be said for those themes in this novel, or short story. We have both of these characters alone, getting drunk. I think you would be forgiven if you had other suspicions the moment a young man walks into a house with another young man and they say, let's get drunk. Let's sit by the fire and get drunk. I don't think I ever did that with any guys, right? So I think that there's, I think that there is playful hinting from Hemingway in this short story, but I don't think that this is evidence for the Nick Adams character that anything was ever consummated. Now, I said that this does the best job of something in literature that I've ever seen. And that is this. On 88 in the Finkovesia, he says opening bottles is what makes drunkards. Bill explained. That's right, said Nick. He was impressed. He had never thought of that before. He had always thought it was solitary drinking that made drunkards. Well, I'm guilty of both of those things, or at least I was in previous years, but this short story captures the idea, the sensation, the effects of being drunk better than any I have ever read. 
And we'll get to that a little bit with number one in the writer's corner. But to follow up on that, 88 into 89, they're talking about each other's fathers. Again, just men. Um, Nick says that Bill's dad is a swell guy. You bet your life he is, Bill said. My old man's all right, Nick said. You're damn right he is, said Bill. He claims he's never taken a drink in his life, Nick said, as though announcing a scientific fact. Well, he's a doctor. My old man's a painter. That's different. He's missed a lot, Nick said sadly. You can't tell, Bill said. Everything's got its compensations. He says he's missed a lot himself, Nick confessed. Well, Dad's had a tough time, Bill said. It all evens up, Nick said. They sat looking into the fire, thinking of this profound truth. I'll get a chunk from the back porch, Nick said. He had noticed while looking into the fire that the fire was dying down. Also, he wished to know that he could hold, he wished to, he wished to show he could hold his liquor and be practical. Even if his father had never touched a drop, Bill was not going to get him drunk before he himself was drunk. They keep going back and forth. Nick came in with a log, and he is trying to be practical. They're both already drunk. When you're drunk, you're always the last one to know you're drunk. They're both already drunk as they tell each other, let's get drunk. They're both drunk, trying to prove, I'm not drunk. I'm not drunk. I have no idea if women do that too. I have no idea. But guys always try to prove how sober they are. Guys always try to prove how not drunk they really are. I, I, and it leads to some stupid stuff. I, I had a roommate. We were trying to prove to each other we weren't drunk, so we got into a fight club with each other, just beating the living hell out of each other, um, which is one of the drunkest things that you can do. So it didn't make any sense right off the top. But yeah, th this entire short story, Nick is trying to prove how sober he is, and so is Bill. And it's, it's just, it's one of these things the writer doesn't have to tell us. The writer's not telling us that they're drunk. In fact, the, the, the author is telling us they're not drunk through the characters themselves. So it's just a really interesting dynamic. Now, as far as the writer's corner is concerned... There is a great show, Don't Tell, seen here. A really great show, Don't Tell, seen. This is after, right after the last thing that I read. Nick came, through, Nick came in with the log through the kitchen and in passing knocked a pan off the kitchen table. He laid the log down and picked up the pan. It had contained dried apricots soaking in water. He carefully picked up all the apricots off the floor, some of them had gone under the stove, and put them back in the pan. He dipped some more water onto them from the pail by the table. He felt quite proud of himself. He had been thoroughly practical. That is a great show. Nick is drunk. Do not tell us Nick is drunk moment. Nick knocks dried apricots out of a pan where they're soaking in water all over the floor. Some of them have gone under the stove. So he picks them up off of the floor, puts them back in the pan, and adds a little bit of water. If you're not drunk, that doesn't make any sense to you. Those dried apricots are done for. They're on the floor 
in the cottage. Under the stove in the cottage. You should not be eating those. But now that Nick has set the table, everyone will. And the final note that I have here is on 91 of the Think of Asia. Nick said nothing. This is after Bill had talked to him about breaking up with Marge. It's a good thing you did that. Nick said nothing. The liquor had all died out of him and left him alone. Bill wasn't there. He wasn't sitting in front of the fire or going fishing tomorrow with Bill and his dad or anything. He wasn't drunk. It was all gone. All he knew was that he had, he had once had Marjorie and that he had lost her. She was gone and he had sent her away. That was all that mattered. He might never see her again. Probably he never would. It was all gone. Finished. That is a powerful turn. One would be tempted to suggest that it's only really believable in this short story if you allow that Nick is drunk. But really, that's not it at all. Really, Nick might be one of these insufferable people. These insufferable people that refuse to be happy. These insufferable people who refuse to take something good while it's there for them. Instead, they will chase it away. They will ruffle it up and shove it out the door. Kind of, from what we know about Ernest Hemingway, this was Ernest Hemingway. So, I'm pointing this out as a bit of good writing, when really, it's either terrible writing or great writing. I err towards it being great writing. If you have been in this place, you understand exactly what Nick is going through. Nick has pushed away the one thing that made him happy. Nick has pushed away the one thing with which, with whom, he had a future. Nick pushed away, probably, the thing he loved. And sure, he has Bill there, but a Bill is a poor replacement for a lover. What is that? What it, a son is a poor, it's from Psycho. A son is a poor substitute for a lover, something like that. A Bill is a poor substitute for a lover. Naked sword and all. That is all I have for this short story discussion, The Three-Day Blow, the tenth in this series. If you like or appreciate what it is that I do here, hitting the like button really does help me out as it tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And if you find yourself here by chance but not designed, there's literature on the channel all the time. We are doing a read-along for The Fink of Asia. We just got, we're getting to the point where we're going to be through with Dubliners by James Joyce. We're reading through Sylvia Plath at the moment, reading through the newest Stephen King at the moment. So uh, I, ho I hope to have you back for the next one.